Don't you want to come with me? Don't you want to feel my bones? My bones to pick with this police procedural comedy drama series, that is. That's right, today we're talking about Bones, a show centred on the relationship dynamic between Special Agent Seeley Booth and Dr. Temperance Bones Brennan, with Booth providing a religious, God-centred, sociable character, and Bones providing the atheist, antisocial, was based on an autistic person, but ultimately the showrunner decided to not make them actually autistic in the show because it was feared that it would affect ratings and audience engagement character. Wow, that already is some messed up stuff that does not in any way make me hopeful for how well the show will treat trans people. Look, I know we are back in the lawless time period of 2005 when mainstream media didn't give two hoots about pretty much any minority at all, or properly presenting their lives in a way that humanised them, but still. Anyway, the episode in question is Season 4's Episode 7, the he in the she... Mm. Oh, for God's sake, no. No. Why do all these shows always have the worst titles for their trans episodes? Like, come on, there had to have been a better option than that one. Well, expectations are set to rock bottom, but yet again, let's see how the episode plays out. Let's give Bones a chance to bring us back in. It might just be able to do it. This Bones episode starts like all good Bones episodes begin. With some stoners at a beach, fishing and talking about climate change, discovering some bones of a person. That's why they call it bones. Because, because human bodies have bones in them. And they look at the bones and figure out why we can see those bones without the meat suit on. 20 years it took for me to get that one. It's pretty subtle stuff. This then jumps to the less common opening thing from a Bones episode, which is the two main characters in a counselling session, because they are partners, brackets professionally, and there is like a whole complex situation between them with romantic entanglements, and that whole having to work together but hating each other while also maybe kind of liking each other. Look, the rivals slash enemies to lovers trope is a favourite of shows for a reason. We all secretly want to hate fuck some people, like me and the ghost of J.K. Rowling's writing career. All the things I would do to that violent assault of literary history that is the ink black heart. Mm -mm -mm. Maybe later. Also, quickly zoom and enhance on that therapist character, the, the man named Sweets. Is that John Francis Daly? from Freaks and Geeks, as well as Yo Gabba Gabba. I'm Martin. I'm Sam. And I'm John. Are you ready? Oh, yeah! Get up, get up, let's go! It is John Francis Daly from Freaks and Geeks, as well as Yo Gabba Gabba. Wow, what a small world. This scene is mostly designed to give David Boreanaz a chance to show off his acting style that he developed so well over the course of Angel and Buffy, which is not a joke. I actually really liked him in both of those shows and thought that his cool but also kind of weird slash a little funny worked really well. Would you like to dance? I don't dance. Oh, and of course, digging into him, he was involved in a sexual harassment lawsuit. I mean, you know, who the fuck isn't involved in one from bloody Hollywood these days? You know, god damn it, what would it take for them to just stop doing that? They go off to look at those bones, because looking at bones is the point of the bloody show, and when they get there, the first thing that bones, as in the Dr. Bones, whose actual name is Dr. Brennan, but she is called bones because of her special interest in that field, though understandably calling her bones is going to get confused using when we talk about bones as well. Do, do you understand what I mean? Ah, you're smart, you'll figure it out. But as I was saying, Bones looks at these bones and tells us that she can't figure out what sex these bones are without the pubic bone, though she pronounces it like this. I'm not able to ascertain sex without a pelvic bone, pelvic bone, pelvic bone. Public bone? Could they not get more than one take of the character whose job and obsessive pursuit this whole show is based around saying the name of the bone correctly? 
pelvic bone. But the other forensic person on the scene says that based off the scrap of cloth on the body, we can probably assume that this is a woman. Though maybe that assumption might come back to bite us, as in the forensic people, in the ass later on. Maybe maybe some little revelation is going to make it all seem a little silly to assume that. Ooh. But anyway, we also find out that this body has breast implants, which suddenly gets the interest of FBI agent Booth because man plus boobs. The comedy is stellar stuff, really. That could be a breast implant. Breasts, that's my department, okay? And we also get told that the reason there is no bottom half of the bones is because the spine got cut in half. Yeah. No shit, Sherlock. Did it really require an expert to tell us that one? The bottom half is missing because the bottom half got removed. Revolutionary stuff. Why is there only half a skeleton? Because the spine has been severed. In the lab, after the intro credits, the new higher student guy tells us that this woman also had plastic surgery done on her face, and it connects with the fake boobs because... I guess if you are likely to get one surgery done, you are more inclined to get more done. That wasn't my experience with it. One was more than enough for me to wish never to do anything like that ever again. But I guess making assumptions about victims is what forensics is all about. Using our innate biases to make decisions that could drastically affect cases. I mean, when you describe it like that, it almost makes the human factor seem like a bad thing. We also get told how these bones got fucked up by something that maybe made them dead. And also a bunch of scientific mumbo jumbo about sediments and polymer and crap. The remains show traces of fresh water and pelagic sediment. I've discovered microscopic tooth shards from the Elosa sapidissima, traces of copolymer on the vertebrae nearly microscopic. It's the kind of thing that I put in the same camp as like what Star Trek and Star Wars do, where they throw out these words that are ultimately meaningless jargon to a large part of the audience, but they sound good and official and smart, so it helps to make the character saying them look like they know what they are doing. The name of this woman is discovered as our main characters go to track down her plastic surgeon, who recently replaced an implant because it was leaking. And her name is Patricia Ludmuller, a regular woman who got work done, but also raises a few questions with where she lives, because it's a dead-end place that all the weirdos go to hide, apparently, according to the FBI man. How many people live on Mailer Island? I'd say about a couple thousand. That's one of those end-of-the-world places where the weirdos flock. And Bones questions why you would make yourself so beautiful with surgeries and effort and money and time, only to hide yourself somewhere like this. Ah. Foreshadowing is the largest consistent feature of every trans episode that I've ever done. It's right up there with transphobia for repeat appearances. Something that I imagine will rear its ugly head right around the time we finally get told this is a trans woman, and the right to decide if we should feel disgusted by or pity for this trans woman, whether she is villain or victim. I'm going to put my money right now, and this is a legitimate guess because I can't remember this episode from when I watched Bones 20 years ago, that she was killed by a man she was sleeping with, and that man discovered she was trans, and then murdered her. And that the show will arrest him, but maybe pull some sympathy stuff from the guys in the show, who will be like, yeah, it's bad that he killed a person, but also she kind of maybe deserved it for not telling that guy the truth, the very truth that made him go violent in the first place, the violence that probably makes a lot of trans people who are stealth not want to tell partners that fact. Yeah, it is a flawed logic, but it makes sense as long as you remember that trans people are not like full people with the same rights to exist and live in the minds of cis creators from this time period, and the audience that they appeal to. That's my guess anyways. I'm perfectly happy and hoping that I will get proved completely wrong, and this episode will actually be super trans supportive and sensitive. Pigs have been known to fly after all. We get a little religious argument, it's a mainstay of the show's interaction between the main protagonist characters, within the home of the deceased woman because they discover that she was super into a variety of religious texts, as well as being the pastor at a local grassroots church, which Booth takes issue with, because surely a pastor shouldn't be so vain to get breast implants and face surgery stuff. Weird thing to get stuck on, I guess, but he is old-school classic American Catholic, 
which I guess tracks. Patricia is also getting called on from a boyfriend or a dude called JP who wants to see her desperately. You have one new message. Hey, it's JP again. I, I miss you. I need to see you. It's important. I really need you, Patty. Please call. The clues are all coming together. And then we find out that the pelvis has washed up somewhere else and needs to get taken to the lab right away because it's been about 10 minutes and we need to finally get our revelation scene. Fingers crossed. The grad student guy begins referring the examination to the lower half of the body as a guy now for some reason as he begins crafting a possible scene. He's in the water. When he reaches for the boat, his fingers are smashed. He drowns. He. Mm -hmm. Isn't that weird which then turns into a slight dispute as the grad student guy argues that the pelvis is a certain shape and that defines a specific sex and gender remember that for a lot of people sex and gender are intertwined hard and that specific features are going to define how they will see you forever seriously burn my body when i am dead good luck misgendering a pile of ash future dickwads and the forensic lady notes that the body has a vagina and a vagina is a woman thing. The pelvic bone can say whatever it wants to say. This part here says female. What part's that? It's called a vagina. See, this is one of those times when both sides are kind of wrong. They are fighting over two specific biological features as if those are going to determine what is the definitive statement on this person's identity. And the truth is that, well, that person picked what their identity was and deserves better than having forensic vultures tear who they are apart to see if they can make a decision on it better. Regardless, they then both concede that this is a victim who is both male and female, and therefore maybe has two sexes. Jumping out of the lab and into the office, Sweets, Booth and Bones are all discussing this news, with them using a mixture of language around the victim, but at the very least they are calling her a she. And Bones does give an accurate description of sexual reassignment surgery to the admittedly pain expressions of the two guys. How do they do that? They split the penis and then turn it inside out. And then they use the glands to create a nerve cluster dense enough to achieve orgasm. It transforms more into a conversation about the religious ramifications of transgender people, specifically due to the fact that she was a pastor. Because surely being transgender is admitting that God made a mistake somewhere. And they all kind of seem to be doing okay right now with not leaping to judgment or to diminishing her personhood. The term trans conveys a meaning of beyond, across, moving further. There's a very spiritual component. Okay, Bones out here proving me wrong. Taking that stand of shows from 2005 can provide semi-competent representation, as long as the trans person is already dead and can't speak for themselves, which admittedly, yeah, us being a dead victim in the equation is a truly unfortunate consistent stereotype, but at least it's been kind of respectful so far. They argue about what they think the murder case might be, and it's a toss-up between whether a religious nut found out she was trans and killed her, or a partner found out she was trans and killed her. Hey, that's what I was guessing. And then Booth immediately tanks any generated goodwill by saying all this shit about the JP guy we heard on the voice message at Patricia's house. He had no idea that she wasn't a real woman. It's very insightful. Thank you. Insightful, see? Except for the real woman slip. Ugh, Bones, you were doing so good. Well, you were doing so completely neutrally okay until this point. Hopefully this ends with Booth re-evaluating his transphobic attitudes shown here. And the next part of this scene, while poorly handled, does show Booth making the comment that she deserves the respect of being referred to as a woman because that is what she chose to be when she died. He doesn't say it as succinctly and lacking of misgendering as I did there, but at the end of the day, I get it. We are showing to our cis audience a bunch of cis characters dealing with a group that many of them have had no interactions with and have no real point of reference to not keep fucking up basic decency towards. I understand that even cis people who are trying to be better are still going to mess it up. Does that make it easier to watch? Not really. Does that still make it kind of uncomfortable how this whole scene of pronouns identity of a dead fucking person is played as a somewhat joke? Kinda yeah. Look, there's no way the guy on that answering machine knew that he 
she, he, knew that she, he, was transgender. We find out in a church funeral kind of scene that Patricia meant a lot to a lot of people in this area. That she clearly had quite a tight-knit community and Bones does that thing she does where she openly states the cold facts of what she sees in these people with no regard for any kind of kindness or social grace. See that aforementioned bit about the creator basing her on an autistic person but not actually making her autistic or communicating with autistic people in having it be a cohesive and kind representation of us. Braster is his daughter. What are you doing? I'm praying. Would you keep your voice down? You're not a member. I mean, shit. It's also not one of those cases where if you want to claim her, you have to do it via headcanon, which the trans community is also very familiar with. Quite the crossover event of the year, though a crossover event that happens a lot according to studies. Shout out to my fellow autistic trans people. Regardless, one of the pastor guys called Chuck is quite combative and very aggressive towards these cops. Regarding his past as a meth head and the fact that the community is full of other people with criminal backgrounds. Yeah, we do have a few felons in our congregation. Former addicts. I myself had a meth problem. Would you like to arrest me? And the... Well, I mean, that also he is grieving, but such a thing here feels designed to make us as an audience suspicious of this man. We also get to meet JP, who is brought in for questioning, and we also meet the psychologist lady, who was one of the biggest icons for me when I was younger. Look, you know, we've all got people that we saw and went, God, maybe I'd like to look like that one day. We find out that JP is an abusive husband, who is kind of struggling to patch things up with his wife, maybe because, as these two FBI people seem to believe, it was because he was hooking up with Patricia. Also, the psychologist lady then looks at a photo and says that he knew- Oh, hold, hold on a minute. Look at the last photo. He knew. You can't tell that from a photo. Beg your pardon? I can. Is, is psychology just magic? Like, I know you can read a lot from body language and positioning and attitude, but surely you cannot see a single photo and go, uh, oh, yep, that dude was clued in that she is a trans woman. He's got those, uh, those trans woman eyes. Seen it before. Booth then decides to be an asshole to try and get JP to freak out, calling Patricia not a real woman and saying that maybe JP got gay in jail, or at least... I really, really hope that this is all a ploy, because otherwise, yikes. And if it is a ploy, it does work. JP gets defensive and argues that she was never a man, that she was always a woman, and the psychologist lady uses her magical bullshit powers to look at another photo and confirm that she is on JP's side here. If you'd have ever met Patty, you know what I know. What God knows, what she knew. She was not a man. I'm with him on this one, Booth. What is happening here? Was Booth doing this intentionally? Because while he succeeded in getting JP riled up, it didn't really help give them any more information than that JP was like a trans positive dude who didn't see Patricia's past as denying her womanhood, nor a reason to stop seeing her or having romantic feelings towards her. It just feels like the show did some bigoted stuff for bigoted stuff's sake and the purpose was maybe achievable through other means? You lost your manhood and your religion all in one go. Or what, did prison just widen your tastes? You're just pretending to be a jerk to get a rise out of this guy, right? Mixed stuff in the episode so far all around right now. The additional examination of the victim tells us that she was on HRT and offers the student guy a chance to misgender Patricia again, while also implying that she went overseas to Thailand to get a sex change which Bones does shoot down because they shouldn't be doing that kind of conjecture, just the cold, hard facts of the case in the lab. Very good, Mr. Nigel Murray. Though conjecture is not really what we do here in the lab, so. Which we as the audience are indicated to see as Bones just being a hard ass rather than it being like the actual truth that they shouldn't be doing that sort of thing because it influences the case and the people around it and their perspectives towards it. Like seriously, you warp how you view something based on the assumptions that you make at the start. I mean, look at me with every single trans fucking episode that I do. That's a meta joke. 
I hope it's understood by my audience that I am a subjective and partial mouthpiece for viewing this media through, and not the objective truth speaker that some YouTubers seem to like to pretend that they can be. I will be wrong, and I will make calls that maybe aren't right sometimes, but I believe to be the truth. The psychologist lady then shows up in a scene between two characters that has no relevance to anything that we care about, and showcases how she was doing some off-the-books masculization sketches of this trans woman, like making her features more masculine and then changing her hair and giving her a beard or to make it apparent this person looks like somebody else that we should know. A guy that, well, the audience doesn't know, but the people in the show do know. A TV evangelist, Patrick Stevenson. This money belongs to God, giving God what is rightfully his. Will you deny him? Really? Patrick to Patricia? Why do cis shows keep making it so the trans person takes the boring route towards their new name? Like, a lot of the trans people that I know did a big leap. Did something different than the name they were given, partly because if you were doing such a big change anyway, you might as well go with what feels right. And also because the bigger a change you can do, the easier it's going to be for people to remember it and not fall into old habits. I'm now a little bit worried that my initial guess was completely wrong, and this episode is going to go down the Ace Ventura route of having this trans woman actually be a guy who just pretended to be a woman to escape some kind of criminal past or the nefarious means, even though it is frankly wild for a cis man to get all these surgeries for just that purpose. Would a real woman have to wear one of these, be missing these, to get rid of big old Mr. Kanish. I seriously doubt that Bones is going to go there though, because while that would affirm the modern day turf belief that the trans community is just some shadow organization designed to provide cover for evil men who willingly go through intense body changes and social adjustments for reasons, I think that such a thing would be frankly insane for the episode's narrative. I mean, we do have 20 minutes left, so I guess there is time for another wild plot twist to pop out, but I have to hope not. Also, before we move on, what is this psychologist's deal? She can magically tell what people are thinking or feeling from a picture, and she can also de-trans people in drawings well enough to know what they looked like beforehand? Is, is her job just to move the plot along and they will give her whatever powers are needed to pull that off? Maybe. So, the crazy thing for me here, because they do this whole revelation scene about who Patricia used to be, she had a wife and a son, she led a cultish religious group, she disappeared in Thailand about a year before she appeared as Patricia in that wacky island place, but like, does all of this hold relevancy to the case? Because if it doesn't, it feels like we are dredging up painful parts of somebody's past that maybe would be better left unmessed with. Admittedly, it is kind of a shitty thing for a trans woman to abandon her family like this to become who she is meant to be. But it's not my job to pass judgement on someone like that. I mostly reserve my judgement for the cis people. I don't know, it, it just felt like it was an odd tangent designed to add another twist and some more runtime to the episode, while also affording us more opportunity for transphobic narratives and situations. So that guy went from that to being a woman pastor in a cottage on Chesapeake Bay. Which is exactly what the wife proceeds to do, arguing that Patrick would never do this because it's a sin to alter one's image, yada yada, made in God's image, so doing so is saying that he is wrong, yada yada. Bones tells her that she has had plastic surgery and dyes her hair, so isn't that altering her image, which she doesn't see as hypocrisy, because when you are a bigot, it's all about focusing on others, rather than considering their relation to yourself as humans. And this is all pretty standard fare. And it's exactly what I expected to happen with this additional reveal. We needed a hardcore transphobic person to give us a clear villain. And Booth with his fumbling occasional bigotry but genial attitude just wasn't cutting it. So how about some hardcore religious shit that makes you realise Patricia ran away from her family for a pretty damn good reason. 
You want me to believe that Patrick stole money and then had himself transformed into a woman? Patrick was a religious man. He would never offend God in this blatant manner. Booth does weirdly take the religious lady's side, because religious people stick together when their faith is being criticised. We then get some more dead ends that lead us towards additional possible motives and ideas for what could have happened, but more importantly, it leads to both of the main characters having a conversation about how each other would feel if the other was a different gender. A hot twist on the, babe, would you still love me if I was a worm? A theoretical question that all couples or budding, probable TV romance couples must do at some point in some form. Would you like me just as much if I were a man? Oh yeah, much better. How about you? Would you like me better if I was a woman? No, I would not. Why? They don't really approach the idea with any serious consideration because they are both very, very cis and the idea is at best a joke for them. But at least they do discuss the idea. That's more than most cis people ever consider in their entire lives. And I do believe the consideration of that notion is useful for either cementing your own identity by contrasting it with options, and for giving you a perspective on trans people by opening yourself to gender exploration in some small way. I am still undecided on whether I like or dislike this Trans Bones episode. I really think the deciding factor is going to come down to how they handle the conclusion, to be honest. Endings are a big deal. They tell us the moral, they give us the idea of how we should walk away from the story. And so every trans episode does come crashing down to how does it finish. We then see that Patricia's child, the one she ditched, is a hardcore Christian like their parents, is happily doing sermons about how bad gays and trans are, though they are put off by the whole economics of the cult-like church they run. Seeing that as a sin, just like the, well, the queers that they despise. They are abominations unto the Lord. They are sodomites. But other sins such as greed, this is a palace. And I am a prince. This leads to them quitting the church and running away to do a different kind of preaching on the street. Street preaching. And when you preach to the street, the street always wins. We then watch as the sun gets brought in and finds out what happened to his father. That she had a sex change and ran a church that welcomed all people, and preached acceptance and openness, and was well loved. Oh, according to her congregation, who loved her, your father welcomed everyone. I just wish I had the chance to know the new him. And it's honestly just a really, really sweet scene to see this kid who hated the life they grew up in, and hated their parents for how they did religion, only to go out and find their own amidst the real struggling people, also discover that their parent had a similar transition religiously. A revelation for them that is mixed up with the sadness and regret of never getting to reconcile and meet one another due to that parent's death. You didn't want me to have to choose between him and God, and I love my father for that. I just hope God can forgive me for making him feel that way. God damn, does Bones do some good scenes occasionally. Maybe the show is somewhat well written, and if a little over the top sometimes. Some misgendering does happen here though, but I kinda get it. There's no real adjustment period, and people are not perfect. Like I said, it could be considered an uncomfortable experience because as a trans person, it's not nice for us to get misgendered. Though jokes are on all of y'all in the comments because my pronouns are any slash all, so you can't win with trying to insult me. I'll take anything you've got, it just makes me more powerful. But in this scene, the misgendering I don't think detracts from the fact that this is a nice moment. That this is a kid acknowledging the gender tradition of their father while also trying to come to terms with the fact that their father changed who they were on a deeper level as well. On the murder front, it looks like Patricia got murked by some person in a boat, who ran her over and then like hit her hands when she tried to grab the edge of the boat, and then hit her again, and then she died, and then a fishing line or some shit cut her in half. Not like an intentional severing in half, though Booth tries to see if there is any sort of metaphysical concept to the idea that she lived her life in two halves, and then in death was also in two halves. 
Because remember, Booth is the spiritual member of the cop partnership here, while Bones is the analytical one who shoots that theory down, because, like, it's got no relevance to the case if it's true or not. Do you think it means anything? You should let your life split in two, then death split in two again. No, I don't think it means anything. I don't think you would. It might be a nice sentiment for this character's transition and themes around them, but it don't mean shit to the actual case. They find the boat, and it turns out that it's JP's boat that did it. And he argues that he never took it out. Though when Bones mentions that many men get violent when they find out a partner is a trans woman, he says that they never slept together because Patricia wouldn't allow it due to him being a married man. And he is clearly frustrated because he is the prime suspect he doesn't want to think that he did it. That's where you smashed your hand. No, will you stop saying these things? You know, normal human stuff. Most of us don't like being considered as a murderer. But Booth soon realises that JP didn't reconstruct this boat for himself. That the seats are set too small for his height. And JP admits that yeah, Patricia told him to restore it for someone else as a project. A certain someone who has been standing behind JP this whole time and looking away very dodgily whenever the camera points towards them. Years. Mr. said it'd be a good project for me. She wanted me. Oh, uh, perhaps 100... The wife! The wife who waited for JP and got mad that he fell in love with another woman and who killed Patricia. It wasn't a trans thing. It was a jealousy thing. And she gets arrested while the sad ending music plays. And Ryan, Patricia's son, that she left and who never got to know his father as a woman, takes over Patricia's church to keep up her legacy in a kind of bittersweet happy ending to that whole family arc. I am sorry that I didn't get to know my father, Patricia. But I hope I will find him, her, that redeemed human being. And that is where the episode ends with Booth saying the theme of it, which is redemption through transformation. Redemption through transformation. I get it. So where do we start with this review, really? I mean, I think the first place to go is to how wrong I was. How my assumptions about what Bones would do, based on my own fears of 2005 TV shows and cis writers and cis audiences, coloured my perspective in a negative fashion. Was the language around Patricia awkward and clunky, and occasionally uncertain about how to treat her gender identity? It was, but at its heart, Bones told a story that never denied Patricia her womanhood at the end, that never made her into a villain or a trans victim, because she didn't become trans to pull off some mastermind plot, and she wasn't killed because of her trans identity. She was killed because of her identity as a woman, and how that threatened the marriage of another. Because a cis straight man loved her, and his wife couldn't take that. And all you did was fall in love with another woman. I never slept with her, Rita. I don't believe that. I'll never believe that. All the people around Patricia loved her for who she was came to her for advice and counselling, and saw her as a community leader that cared for the disaffected and those who had been cast away by society. Her son, who grew up being taught the same hate that she had, the same hate that her ex-wife still clung to thanks to its material benefit, eventually left, and while he was unable to meet his redeemed father as a woman, he still gets to interact with her through the people she touched and left behind who knew her as the person he hoped for her to become. Both in her old Bible, and more importantly, knew the people who she loved, and who loved her back. Spiritually, it's a very positive story spun from the tragedy of a murder. And while the trans stuff was used for some comedic effect, was used to have some twists for us the audience, ultimately, that same story could have been told without her being trans in an almost exactly the same fashion. I do wish that the trans person wasn't dead in it, but it is a murder series, and people of all types get murdered in those. It's not Bones' fault. That's more just a complaint born from decades of seeing trans people as dead bodies in TV shows and movies. The show does give us this post-insight of Patricia as more than a dead body or a victim. 
as somebody who overcame great difficulty and was loved, who changed not just her physical self, but how she engaged with the world, who became someone different but also better. It's humanising. It's a good trans story, because it's not totally dependent upon the character being trans. That's more just a character trait that is used to influence and guide the narrative, that works into the themes that it is trying to adopt. I actually really liked it. And that feels strange to say. I never expected Bones to be one of the better episodes I've covered on this channel, and yet here we are. It was really, really good. Hopefully you liked what I said here, or agreed with it in some way, or learned something, or whatever one might get out of this. If so, that's great, and it's what I hope to achieve on this channel. Please consider giving it a like, share, subscribe, and comment to tell YouTube to let other people see it as well. If you really like what I've done here, then you can make sure that when you die, you leave your bones in the most environmental storytelling position possible. Like in a bathroom holding a teddy bear and surrounded by lettered cubes that spell out red rum. You know, some real Fallout style shit. Otherwise, a fantastic way to financially support the channel is by going to my Patreon, my Ko-Fi, or as a member here on YouTube, and subscribing there. It really does help to provide me direct, literal aid towards paying for the food, housing, power, and internet that I use to stay alive, to keep my bones inside of my body, an essential aspect of video creation. I have many, many more trans videos to go, because God has punished me for my hubris and my work will never be finished. All of my costs of living have gone up recently, thanks to being forced out of this place by the landlords and into a new location by myself. A new place whose updated recording booth will get revealed when I eventually get around to setting it up and working out how a teleprompter is meant to function. The names of those in the five door and up category should have been scrolling past the screen this whole time and I really do appreciate all of them for helping to make this something that I do for more than just a hobby. Something that I can really dedicate a lot of time towards. With all of that said, thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a great day.